Paloma South Cabin Hall is a bibliographer um, at the, the, the Bureau American Collection um, Library, Memorial Library, and she, for those of you who are um, graduate students or, or undergrad or faculty doing research on Latin America, the Caribbean, or, or Iberian Peninsula, she is doing office hours each week um, to help you with your research. Um, she wanted me to let folks know that today she she won't be here, but she will be coming um, at one o'clock today to our office um, for about an hour, and we'll be available for any of you if you have questions. And then um, for the next three dates during the lunch time lecture series, she will also be available from one to two. Yeah, so I just wanted to let people know that. Um, for those of you who are new and haven't been to our talks before, um, we do have a sign up board there in the corner. If you wanted to be added to our list, we will send you our weekly event calendar. So um, there are there's tea and coffee and some snacks in the back if you're interested. Um, so without further ado, I'll um, introduce Martin Gaspar. Um, Martin is a graduate of Harvard and a current lecturer in Spanish and Portuguese at UW. His research engages a wide range of fields that include Latin American literature and intellectual history since the conquest, translation studies, modern Latin American fiction and contemporary films, and narrative and psychoanalytic theories of literature. So we are pleased to have you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all for coming in this uh, difficult day, wet day out there. Um, so my talk today um, is titled Anonymity in the Andes from Vargas Llosa to Claudia Llosa. But I'm going to go through Arguedas in my discussion. That's why the title is a bit different. Um, so um, in 2010, Mario Vargas Llosa was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature for, quote, his cartography of structures of power and his trenchant images of the individual's resistance, revolt, and defeat, end quote. The announcement was hailed in mainstream Peruvian newspapers like El Comercio as a deserved recognition for, to our most universal writer and our best living author. Beyond paying respects to the literary achievements of the novelist, the reception of the Nobel Prize was otherwise lukewarm. At 74, the image of Vargas Llosa has eroded in his native country, in great measure due to his right-leaning politics and controversies, controversies surrounding his candidacy for president in 1990. This year, 2011, was a centenary of the birth of the Peruvian intellectual anthropologist and writer Jose Maria Arguedas, who, according to many, expressed a deep and visceral knowledge of the Andes, and by extension Peru, like no other. Even more, Arguedas' life, very life, since his early childhood when he lived among Indians and learned their culture and language, to his tragic suicide in 1969, which is anticipated in his posthumous novel uh, the fox from up above and the fox from down below, El zorro de arriba, El zorro de abajo, has been seen as a true incarnation of Peruanidad with its struggles and joys. So this coincidence of Argueta's centenary with Vargas Llosa's prize prompted a question that, in some circles, was purely rhetorical. Arguedas or Vargas Llosa? I'm going to pass this around. Shall I? This is uh, from a magazine, a magazine from Puno, south of Peru, in the Indian region, very close to the Titicaca uh, Lake. And of course, we can, I'm saying it's rhetorical because we can find the, the answer in the cover itself. This is an image of Arguedas. Uh, Vargas Llosa here is described as a cosmopolitan, universal writer living in Europe, a talented and politically suspect author who deployed local materials abroad. Arguedas represents quite the opposite a transculturating local author and ethnographer who spoke Quechua and registered and identified with the lives of dispossessed Indian natives and mestizos. The Arguedas versus Vargas Llosa opposition in this scheme correlates a long-standing binary in most discussions of Peruvian identity. Tradition, the Andean town, the Quechua language, native communal life versus modernity, uh, the coastal Lima, the Spanish language, immigrant urban life. What these authors uh, did, which made them candidates for the title of national authors, 
was to, from opposite starting points, account for the struggle and tensions between modernity and tradition in their work. Today I would like to look at the fictions of these authors set in the Indian region, the battlefield in all debates of Peruanidad, so as to examine how they conceive tradition in the discussion of national identity through a politics of anonymity. More specifically, I will claim that despite their differences, both Arguedas and Vargas Llosa anonymize the native um, as a way to integrate them into narratives of modernity. My next question then will be, is it possible to portray the native as something other than anonymous without falling into an anti-modern and preservationist framework? I suggest that we may find a possible solution, a solution that does not answer the question but poses it differently, in the work of Claudia Llosa, a filmmaker who reutilizes the paradigms of Arguedas and Vargas Llosa, refashioning their use of anonymity. In what follows, I will triangulate the treatment of, na of the native in works by Vargas Llosa, Arguedas, and Claudia Llosa, then. Because communal celebrations, fiestas, and rituals produce frontiers of belonging, they offer privileged instances to explore the dynamics I want to trace. Therefore, in this discussion, I will refer to Vargas Llosa's uh, Litum and Los Andes, translated as Death in the Andes, a novel that concludes with a retelling of a disturbing cannibalistic liturgy, Arguedas' uh, Yawar Fiesta, a novel about the celebration of the Turu Pukiai, an Indian bullfighting tradition in which the natives confront the bull in groups and armed with dynamite, and Claudia Yosa's Made Inusa, a film which, to those who don't speak uh, Spanish, Made Inusa is the Spanish way of saying made in USA. Um, a film set during the small town celebration of the fictional Tiempo Santo, or holy time. So in these three, I'm going to concentrate on uh, the communal celebrations or rituals. I hope to show how anonymity does not erase identity, in this case, the identity of the native. Rather, anonymity redistributes agency, and identity is the effect of this redistribution. So let me explain briefly how this operates in each of our authors as a sort of preview of my analysis today. In the case of Vargas Llosa, anonymity blocks the native's possibility of communication, thereby creating an enclosed identity that justifies the monopoly of the non-native discourse. In Arguedas, anonymity produces a diffusion of agency, redefining identity from singular to collective. And in the case of Claudia Llosa, her film Madre Inusa seems to both uh, to both work with and expose the mechanisms of anonymization, thus making the relationship between agency and identity a contested field. This uh, will all come clear as I discuss them one by one. To begin discussing Vargas Llosa's representation of the native Indian, we have to refer to a crucial episode in 1983. That year, Vargas Llosa was commissioned to investigate the killing of eight journalists in the small town of Uchuracay in the Indian region of Ayacucho. At the time, the ferocious Shining Path, a Maoist guerrilla group intent on starting a peasant revolution to, to topple the bourgeois government, was fought with equal brutality by the government, which left the locals, especially in small towns, exposed to heavy attacks of the two forces. Eight journalists had been killed, presumably by confused natives that took them for terrorists and Vargas Llosa was sent by then-president Belaunde Terry to investigate the circumstances. His report, Informe sobre Uchucaray, um, was to become infamous because of how it attributed the crimes to native Andeans. Beyond reporting the immediate causes of the killing that were easily traceable to the internal armed conflict, the Informe contained a lengthy section on non-immediate reasons. The killings, said the report, were the result of the irrational action of incapable of communication primitives used to violence and sadly abandoned by civilization. The report was roundly criticized later, even officially, in several pages of the 2003 Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that investigated the deaths of over 69,000 Peruvians during the armed conflict. This is a conflict that lasted um, since 1982 until 1993. Um, the experience of 
uh, Uchirakai would haunt Vargas Llosa, who rewrote his visit to the Andes, in, the Andes in an article titled The Story of a Massacre, and fictionalized some of its elements in Lituma and Los Andes 10 years later in 1993. One might even trace the episode to one of the vignettes he wrote for the 2001 coffee table National Geographic book titled Andes, that I also have here, Um, in this book, Vargas Llosa wrote vignettes inspired by the uh, series of photographs by Pablo Corral Vega, and one of them is telling of how the writer conceives the indigenous as utterly other, detached from the modernizing process and prone to magical thinking. This is the image um, that inspired this writing on the part of Vargas Llosa. They are on opposite pages. Woman with no name. I don't know what my name is by now. I've forgotten over the years. Because, just take a look at me. I'm a tired old woman. I don't remember how old I am, either. But who's going to care? The important thing is that I was born in Paucartambo, and here I'm going to die. If, in fact, I die uh, someday. Sometimes I think that God our Father has had me live so long because she wants me he wants me to be immortal like him. This is almost expected in a book of this sort. Um, the exotic other, ageless, immutable, and immobile. She will die where she was born. A creature without a name, alien to history, and stuck in its geography. This, however, is the same anonymous woman, or a version of it, that we see at the end of the 1983, the story of a massacre. This is at the end of the, of the article. We were preparing to leave when a tiny woman from the community began to dance. She was murmuring a song that we could not understand. She was an Indian, as small as a child, but with the wrinkled face of an old woman and the scarred cheeks and swollen lips of those who live exposed to the cold in the mountains. A woman who seemed to have come from a different Peru from the one in which I live my life, an ancient and archaic Peru, which has lived among these sacred mountains despite centuries of isolation and adversity. Note here how uh, Vargas Llosa affiliates the primitive with the underdeveloped, as small as a child, and with the old, wrinkled, old, ancient, and archaic. The anonymous woman who survives among sacred mountains stands for a culture then that in its isolation can only persist standing outside of history a geological culture, as it were, as immortal as the old woman with no name. There is no possible communication between the modern writer that comes to investigate the crime and this subject who cannot have a name. Uh, through anonymity, Vargas Llosa integrates the native, but without attempting to negotiate the dialogue. She is Peruvian, yes, but only as an apparition. She has come from a different Peru. This brings us to Lituma and Los Andes, a novel about a modern subject authorized by the government, Corporal Lituma, who has been deployed in the Indian town during the Shining Path attacks. Instead of investigating the deaths of a journalist, as in uh, the Uchuracay version, this urban outsider is investigating the disappearances of two villagers. The novel opens with an anonymous woman reporting the absence of her husband, and this is the third crime. When he, this is Lituma, saw the Indian, this is, these are the first paragraphs of the novel. When he saw the Indian woman appear at the door of the shack, Lituma guessed what she was going to say. And she did say it, but she was mumbling in Quechua while the saliva gathered at the corners of her toothless mouth. What is she saying, Tomasito? I couldn't catch it, Corporal. The civil guard addressed her in Quechua, indicating with gestures that she should speak more slowly. The woman repeated the indistinguishable sounds that affected Lituma like savage music. He suddenly felt very uneasy. Instead of dancing and murmuring as the woman in the story of a massacre, this woman, again old, again decaying, again anonymous, utters sounds like savage music and can barely pr produce communication or have any kind of any agency other than re the reporting. Note also how the passage invites us to imagine her expressionless, 
almost subhuman. And again, we find here a similar <coughs> uneasiness and sadness on the part of the modern observer, originated by the encounter with the ontological other and by the failures of civilization. The novel ends with a deeply disturbing scene. Lituma extracts from a native the confession that the three disappeared men had been killed and cannibalized in an abject liturgy to appease the spirits of the mountains in times of war. Pushing the natives to cannibalism erects the ultimate wall that the modern subject cannot transpose. Lituma in Los Andes is not just a fictionalization of the informe de Uchuracay, but also its logical continuation. It is a logic that we can see already at play in an upon reconsideration not so innocent, exoticizing vignette, woman with no name. Anonymity of the native in Vargas, Llosa, um, in Vargas Llosa denies a voice and cripples agency. Lituma, or the investigator, or the vignette writer, monopolize the discourse and speak on her behalf, or about her. We would not expect Arguedas, well known for his knowledge, respect, and admiration of Andean native cultures, uh, that he would coincide with Vargas Llosa in denying the natives a name in his narratives. Yet he does. To what ends? I think we find the answer by locating Arguedas in dialogue with indigenous literature, a literary trend with nationalistic overtones that denounced the subjugation of the natives and also imagined an organic national identity by invo invoking them. Since 1950, all editions of Yawar Fiesta, which was initially published in 1941, are preceded by an essay uh, that Arguedas wrote to distance his work from indigenism. In his novel, he remarks as a way of explanation, the Indians go unnamed. Quote, this is a quote from the introductory essay. There are scarcely any Indian names, casi no hay nombres de indios, in Yawar Fiesta. It tells the tale of several heroic deeds performed by Pukio's four Indian communities. It is an attempt to portray the community's soul, end quote. Arguedas stays away from the indigenous narrative device of concentrating the struggles of the community in the names and voices of particular individuals, and there are several examples of that in the indigenous, uh, in the indigenista literature. For example, Alcides Arguedas' uh, Raza de Bronce ends with a lament of the wise old man Choquehuanca, Tungsteno, a novel by Cesar Vallejo, published in 1931, concludes with the eloquent discourse of Servando Huanta, the community's organic intellectual, and Wasipungo, published in 1934 um, by Ecuadorian uh, Icaza, ends with the powerful and agonizing scream of the protagonist, Andres Chiliquinga. So here, the tradition in the in, uh, novela indigenista is to um, um, represent the community through one hero, one individual. But Arguedas' goal wasn't to simply overcome a deficiency in an indigenista narrative strategy that we may label romantic. By rendering the native anonymous in the treatment of a typical indig indigenista theme, as he does in Yawar Fiesta, he was also revising the underlying politics of indi indigenous fiction. The indigenista novel of the first decades of the 20th century pitted modernity against tradition, as epitomized in Wasipungo, where the construction of a road literally destroys traditional forms of agric agriculture and maims and subjugates the hero, the hero. Arguedas is not interested in capturing an idealized tradition through a singular named hero, but, as we saw, in telling tales of heroic deeds, tales that even include the construction of a road. So, let's look at a dialogue where two mestizo bystanders um, discuss the Indians early in the novel. This is a passage from Yawar Fiesta. The Ayu, which is a, a small village, is determined to go after the bull, uh, after Misitu, which is the name of the bull that is going to be part of the, the bullfight in, in the upcoming celebration, even if it takes 500 Indians to do it. The bull is going to have his heyday up there on the Puna. What a gutting there is going to be. When the Indians have their minds, 
and uh, their minds made up, there's no stopping them. Didn't you see how they built the road to Nazca in 28 days? That's because there were more than 10,000 Indians working, too. They got road fever. Les entró fiebre del camino. You should have seen them. They looked like ants. And they'll bring that bull in. You'll see. It's true that it's only one IU, but there's 2,000 of them. He might be dead, but they'll put him in the bull ring. The Puquillo Indians have determination. Tienen resolución. Whatever else. No doubt about it. Those Indians are really stubborn. These spectators express pejoratively, uh, they look like ants, what is undoubtedly a feeling of admiration and perhaps envy. By anonymizing the native, this, among other passages of Yawar Fiesta, diffuses heroism. And that's, that's um, my point for uh, anonymity in Vargas Llosa, this diffusion. As these spectators see it, the native's tenacity is devoted to what, in the indigenista framework, would be incongruent ends. The modernizing project on one hand, the construction of the road, and the preservation of a tradition, the transportation of a dangerous bull for the Turupogiai, on the other. Significantly, the structure of the novel insists on juxtaposing this duality, a duality that I claim for Arguedas is not a contradiction. Chapter 7 describes the construction of the road from Puquillo in the Andes to Nazca in the coast, uh, which is a historical event that took place in the 1920s. Chapter 8, the next chapter, describes the painful dragging of a feral bull from his valley to the bull ring. If the natives wanted to preserve their tradition, why do they facilitate the arrival of forces that may destroy it? Um, the two communal projects are not oppositional if we consider that to Arguedas, tradition rejects immutability as much as acculturation. This is a complexity that gets brushed over if the novel is read as squarely indigenista, something that Vargas Llosa himself did in his book, The Archaic Utopia, where he labels Yawar Fiesta a conservative novel and Arguedas a cultural geo uh, ecologist who wanted to, quote, freeze time, stop history to preserve the Indian culture. In fact, the Indians in the novel do not resist modernization, and they never did. We know because there is dynamite in their traditional festivity. This brings us back to Arguedas' use of social realist mode in Yawar Fiesta, and in particular to the anonymity of native characters. Had Yawar Fiesta followed the indigenista paradigm, it would have named a representative of the Indians, a synecdochical figure, whose heroic deeds and fate would stand for the communities. Instead, Arguedas' anonymous Indian allows for a flexible and conciliatory form of progress, and for the telling of communal heroic deeds that are organic to larger forces of tradition. In other words, the representative of the communal will is not a hero, as in indigenismo, but a festivity where no names and no particular individual stands out or stands for. The bullfight itself, on the one hand, and the inverted road that goes from the Andes to the coast, effectively contaminating the paradigm modernity versus tradition. This duality may uh, even go further. The actor in the process of modernization is in fact not the coastal conqueror, as in Vargas Llosa, where the modern subject goes to the Andes to investigate and apprehend, but an Indian subject, collectively heroic and with flexible choices and with that, more profoundly modern. Vargas Llosa's road of national integration from the metropolis to the Andes reappears in Claudia Llosa's 2006 film, Made in Usa. Instead of, of a government official, in the film, the Limeño, who arrives in the Andes is Salvador a young geologist sent by a mining company to visit the quarries and who gets stuck because of problems in the road in Madeinusa's town, Mayayaycuna, which in Quechua means the town no one can enter. The town is reminiscent of Vargas Llosa's paradigm of the Andes, mostly isolated, primitive, and with a perverse understanding of Christian traditions. In this case, they believe in holy time, which is a three-day period between crucifixion and resurrection, 
when God is dead and can see no sins, including incest. The town is hopelessly backward and immutable. By the end of the film, there is no reason to believe that anything will change, or that there is any collective will to change. This is not Argueda's post-indigenous Indian town that can gestate a dialogue with modernity. However, the film ch challenges both the Argadian and the Vargas Llosian anonymization of the native, deploying anonymity as a contested category that exposes ideology and perspective. This is a movie where the gaze, the camera position, is in tension with the plot. And this ten tension eventually explodes in a question mark, an interpolation to the viewer to decide who is anonymous and to examine the ideology behind anonymity. Let me show you how I think the film Made in Nusa achieves this through a series of clips. So this is the scene where uh, Salvador sees Madeinusa for the first time, or we can say they see each other. But the camera suggests that he is the agent and she is observed. We may say this differently. We